Last night, I got a text message, and it came from Mark Shirtliff. It was at uh, 5.28 p.m., which would be mountain time, and I saw just this. I got a PDF of the document and just the line, it's official. And when I opened the PDF, I saw that the judge had signed that the charges against Mark Shirtliff, our former attorney general, were being dismissed. And uh, Mark Shirtliff joins us on the line right now in transit back to Utah. And did you make it to Grand Junction, Mark? <laughs> I, uh, they, I closed the road down that way because of rock slides, so I ended up going to Wyoming. I'm in Clare, Wyoming right now. Yeah. You know where that is. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Hey, Mark, I've, I've got to ask the question, how did you get the information? How did you find out that this had actually come about? Well, as, as soon as Judge Ruby Mills had signed the order, and we weren't expecting it, the last time we talked to her, she said, well, we'll, we'll address this at an August 2nd hearing. And so it was a surprise out of the blue, but she notified uh, the attorneys, immediately sent a copy of that order so we knew it was official and that's what i forwarded on to you so it was just minutes before i sent it to you that that i got the good news i i know we're in a in a situation where we need to be uh, a, a little cautious as to what is being said because things are still in the works but wh what what brought this about mark why were why did troy rollins up in davis county why did he move for this dismissal well, yeah, to bring it up to speed, obviously, uh, for three years now, I've been absolutely proclaiming my innocence, that these charges were misfiled, that they're based on false information, that what people have been reading and hearing in the news media is all a false narrative, that the charges are false, they're based on lies told by people, some people that I put in, in prison, and uh, always looking forward for the opportunity to, to clear it up. And so, as you know, my attorneys filed some very significant motions to dismiss, three in all, uh, with two other potential motions to dismiss based on uh, the, the misconduct of the investigators and the prosecution, speaking of Sim Gill and District Attorney's Office, not Troy Rawlings, uh, and all that was before the court, you know, hundreds of pages of documents and evidence to establish the reasons for dismissal. And it, it was not opposed. Those motions were not opposed by the prosecutor. Um, they really could not be opposed, but um, they were not. And... The judge uh, a week ago Friday had said, "Look, if you, uh, to the prosecutor, if you're not going to if you're not going to oppose them, then you need to let us know. You're past the deadline to oppose. You have not opposed." And in response to that, uh, 2 a.m. Monday morning a week ago, the Troy Rawlings filed his own motion to dismiss, listing his own reasons, and that was the one the judge granted. Even though we we had obviously greatly preferred that she would grant our motions, but. She granted his last night, and, and so that means it's over. And that's good news, and it's wonderful news. There are some issues, as you say, we still have to address, uh, particularly with regard to uh, fees and the, the terrible financial situation. Uh, these three years of false allegations, charges have put on my, myself and my family, um, but we will continue to look at those issues and discuss them and move forward. We're talking with our former Attorney General, Mark Shirtliff, served three terms as Attorney General. Uh, that, uh, that time expired in 2013. It's interesting, Mark, that none of this really came up while you were Attorney General. These charges, allegations, things of that nature happened uh, shortly thereafter. Well, that's correct. And uh, I'm, look, I'm extremely proud of my service uh, as Attorney General. And um, regardless of what was said, that I, uh, the allegations of misconduct and pay-to-play and all this other nonsense, which it really was nonsense. I mean, I never, I never took or solicited a bribe. Really wasn't alleged to have done so. Uh, you know, f favoring certain people who were. I mean, <laughs> look, when I get a chance to be unplugged, uh, hopefully on your show sometime in the near future, uh, I will detail why, where these allegations came from, why they were. Uh, these false allegations, and, and we can show them defaults, and, and we, we'll, we'll lay all that out uh, eventually, Doug. But um, regardless of what people said, you know, the good out of all this, a couple of good, really good things. One, uh, my family, close friends, you know, all rallied together, and were very supportive. Uh, and not not just them, but throughout the last several years, I, I, I could be in a, in a grocery parking lot or at a, at a RSL game or just about anywhere, and people out of the blue would come up and just tell me, 
that they didn't believe these charges. They thanked me for my service. That kind of stuff kept me going, and that's that's good. The other good is a great law firm, amazing attorneys who, you know, when, when your attorneys feel strongly as you do about something and they let you know, that's that's what you want to hear. That's how zealous they are and how good this law firm, Snow Christians in Martin, know is. And the other good thing is, is frankly, Troy Rawlings. He, you know, prosecutors, their job is not to convict. Their job is to, to seek justice. And they're as responsible for making sure that all the evidence is out there, that any exculpatory evidence is out there. They're not to bring charges unless they uh, have a substantial likelihood of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, and Troy Rawlings, to his credit, is that kind of prosecutor. And his decision to dismiss, uh, it, you know, very, very difficult for a prosecutor to do that. And you can imagine the agents and others who have made allegations against are very upset with him. But uh, he did the right thing, uh, and he'll, he's ready to take whatever criticism people throw at him. But he was one that was willing to work with us. And when he realized that he could not prove this case, that the, that the facts were incorrect, that there were uh, changes in the law, and, you know, that I had been so cooperative since 2007, um, all those reasons are why he moved to dismiss, and I'm grateful for uh, for an ethical prosecutor like Troy Rawlings. Mark, if if I could, and uh, recognizing that there's a lot more that we will talk about sometime in the future, you and I in text last night joked about you know Mark unplugged, and I'm very very much <laughs> looking <clears throat> forward to that. But when we come back, can we talk a little bit about some of the finances? Can we talk a little bit about the effect that this has had on you and your family, and just get a little update? Sure. Yeah. All right. Thanks. We'll we'll do that in just a moment. Let's take a break. We're talking with our former Attorney General Mark Shirtliff on today's Doug Wright Show here at KSL News Radio. We have a real opportunity to uh, chat uh, with our former Attorney General. Charges of corruption, bribery, and so on have been now officially dropped at the prosecutor's request and signed by the judge. Mark Shirtliff is on the line with us. Mark. These last three to four years, uh, I, you and I have been friends for a long time. We have continued to be friends, and we have chatted. I kind of know a little bit of this backstory, but tell our listeners what's been going on in your life and your family and, and your career. Well, thanks, Doug. You know, I, uh, I've been in practice law for 30-plus years, and the vast majority of that's been in the public sector. I, I chose the public sector because, you know, I, I wanted to, to serve. And as you recognize, I mean, public public service, uh, people do that not to get wealthy. Um, I, if private practice attorneys make significantly more than a state attorney general. Not only that, 40, 50 percent 40, of the attorneys in the attorney general's office made more than I did because mine was set by statute. And that's fine. Uh, I never uh, complained about that. I didn't do this to get rich. Uh, and so given, given that, and when I finally finished, I had an opportunity to... Uh, a great international firm to make a significant amount of money so I can start taking care of my family, our debts, and all those other issues that, you know, we would like to move forward on. And then, of course, as you can imagine, when this hits, I lost that job uh, in D.C. It has made with this cloud over me, and it's such a public cloud. And Anybody I talk to, potential clients, potential business opportunities, Everybody Googles me. I can tell you how many times I've been ready to do something, and, and I've got a call back saying, oh, sorry, we just Googled you. You know, we can't talk. So it is. Uh, it has been a massive financial burden. We're basically bankrupt. We're barely getting by. As far as the emotional toll, you, you have been very uh, open about uh, some of uh, your family situations. I know when you decided not to move forward in 2010 and run for the United States Senate, you came on my show and we had a great conversation about some of the reasons within family and with family being a priority why you didn't move forward in that arena. How's the family doing? Well, they're they're relieved, you know. Um, I'm a tough guy. I, I even though you know my whole life and career has been dedicated to justice and truth and integrity, and it was also that was all so important to me. When that's challenged, and in such a public and a huge way, it, it's hard personally, but it's harder on the family, Doug. Um, you know they believe me, but you know my daughter in Texas said, "Just Daddy, I just you know I always knew that you were innocent and believed that you would prevail at the end of the day, but I couldn't help constantly waking up at night thinking you're going to jail." <laughs> You know, it's hard. Their friends asking questions, people they know ask, and, and it's tough. So there's huge, huge relief there, obviously, for my family. A great concern about how we move forward. Um, the fact that the court granted 
the state's motion to dismiss instead of ours meant that cut off my ability to and my right under state law to have my attorney's fees paid for. So not only do we have to figure out a way to pay uh, off the debts we're currently facing, but we've got significant legal fees uh, that we need to find a way to take care of. And uh, so we're assessing how we're going to do that and uh, how to move forward. But that was, a, that was, despite the great celebration that this is finally over, to be denied attorney's fees like that, uh, just it's very disappointing and, and <laughs> That's, that's added uh, some burden, obviously, to our future going forward. I don't know if you can say this publicly, but like, what what kind of, of attorney's fees are you facing now? And many of us uh, who have dealt with some situations, uh, legitimate or, or not, when it comes to paying attorneys to represent us, it can be very, very substantial. And when charges are dropped, the case is not moved forward there is no conviction and it's just thrown out to think of somebody left with a substantial burden of debt is uh, is a little uh, troubling it, it, I, it scares me honestly to, to think what can happen what are you facing well I have some, you know, my attorneys are very qualified and experienced former federal judge Sam Alba uh, Max Wheeler who was one of the you know, greatest attorneys in, in, in this country and, and, and a longtime defense attorney, my classmate, uh, Rick Van Wagner. I mean, their, their fees are significant. They're, they're a great firm and they, and so my, my fees are in the high six figures. I mean, I pay little I can as I move along, but they've had to move forward uh, trusting in, in the fact that someday they'll be able to be paid. Um, again, it, under state law, if you're charged, if, it's, if you're charged with misconduct while in office, and the court dismisses your case or you're found not guilty. Either one, the court dismisses based on your motions, then under state law, you're entitled to have your attorney's fees paid for. Um, but by doing this motion to dismiss and the judge granting that as opposed to ours, it cut that off for us. So, I mean, what's done is done. Uh, we're looking for, you know, how we're going to take care of that and we'll move forward. Um, it's a whole, it's a whole new day, obviously, with this cloud lifted off my shoulders and uh, people around the country are contacting me, and I'm sure I'll be able to, to take care of this. We continue in discussions about how we move forward uh, with the cooperation agreement, what that means, uh, and so that's kind of what the future holds. I remember several years ago when we chatted on the air, and you said that in hindsight, especially looking back over your shoulder at some of the things that had transpired, there are things you certainly would have done differently and what, what are your thoughts on that now at this point you know what uh, I think probably what my biggest problem I would say is is, is that there became I, I you know had this this concept that that I'm untouchable my my standards were I mean I had people offer me honorariums to speak significant honorariums to speak and I would say no opp opportunities to serve on boards and be paid for it I, I always said no to that and I felt like I, I, you know, that I maybe was became somewhat arrogant that that I am not in a position to ever be tempted or bribed or in what may look, you know, sketchy to someone. I know where I'm at, and I know that that I'm not going to do any of that. And so, but by placing myself in a, in a situation where it could look bad or give some liars like Mark Jensen the opportunity to make false allegations uh, against me, then that's. That's what's regrettable. We we had lunch one day. I hope you don't mind me saying this. And we we had a pretty frank conversation about, man, you know, when you're when you're looking at this kind of uh, of uh, penalty, you're looking at these charges. If things were not to have gone your way, you mentioned your your daughter had concerns about this. We all like to think that justice ultimately will prevail, but. You know, we talked quite frankly one day about the possibility of actually going to jail. How real was that for you, Mark? Yeah, I think it was more real for my family. They were more concerned. Uh, I mean, I know the facts. I know what who the accusers were. As we um, developed, and this is public information, we go into it deeper later, that, that many of the false accusations, false allegations, and false public narrative were created by FBI agents and, quite frankly, the, the lead state investigator, Scott Nesbitt, that perjured themselves and put lies and misstatements in search warrant affidavits and so forth. Those are all highly documented. Uh, and I guess that was a huge disappointment for me to see 
you know, people who are in the who have the police power, who have the power to affect our lives so so strongly, where you would expect absolute integrity and truthfulness, and that was not the case in this case. It's very disappointing to see agencies like the FBI and, and the State Bureau of Criminal Investigation to have to do things that are potentially illegal and certainly unethical, and that's that's heartbreaking for a system that I have dedicated my life to. Uh, Mark, but I, I knowing that, Doug. It yes. Question, knowing that, I was never, I was never concerned. I always knew. I, I was anxious to get to court to put these agents on the stand, and, and knew that ultimately the case would be dismissed or that the, there would be not guilty findings. And I'm pleased that an ethical prosecutor, when he got into it and looked at those, looked at the allegations, looked at the charges, looked at the facts, the true facts, not the public narrative, the false public narrative, then he he realized he had a, an absolute ethical responsibility to the case. Over the last uh, three to four years, it has come up several times in conversations on the air, private conversations that you and I have had, that the day will come when you can really talk. And as I mentioned earlier, you've all you alluded to it too. There'll come the day when uh, Mark will be unplugged and you'll unload. Uh, and we're, we're talking about next week. Is that still a go? It is. I'm planning on it. I would I'd love to do that. And uh, I think that a lot of people have a lot of questions. I mean, I've seen it in comments. There's still some misstatements by the press in, you know, saying things. And so, yeah, I, I make some clear things happen. And if mostly the public is to ask questions. Uh, that, uh, boy, that'd be great. Yeah, no, that that would be great. Mark, I know you're in transit back to uh, Utah. I really appreciate you pulling over and taking the time to chat with us. And thank you for being on the show. And we'll work on a date for next week, okay? Sounds good, Jeff. Yeah, thank okay. you. Okay.